On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Improving Sepsis Processes of Care with Remote Patient Monitoring and Interventions. My name is Christine Bingman, and I will be your moderator for this program. Now, at this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Brenna Simcoe is a Clinical Program Director for the Medicine Service Line at Wellspan Health. In this role, she collaborates with leaders across the health system to ensure successful implementation and ongoing maintenance and optimization of clinical outcomes in sepsis care. She is a pharmacist by training with over 10 years of experience in critical care and involvement in sepsis quality improvement initiatives and research. Angie Mays is the clinical coordinator for the Central Monitoring Service at Wellspan Health. In this role, she monitors and manages the daily operations of the central monitoring and central alert teams. Both teams take a centralized system approach to monitor patients across seven acute care hospitals. She has a strong focus in process improvement initiatives and joined the central monitoring and central alert teams in 2017 just prior to its implementation and was involved in CAT development. Angie and Brenna, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Christine. Um, good afternoon to everyone. It's always a little strange presenting to a computer screen when I can't see faces, um, but we're honored and excited to have the opportunity to share Wellspan's journey with sepsis care to the Patient Safety Authority community today. Before we get started, we do have one potentially relevant financial disclosure to make. Due to the success of our sepsis model of care, Wellspan may begin providing sepsis processes of care and remote monitoring as an external service referred to as SPOC to other health systems. However, the presentation today will be focused on a description of our internal data and model and will not employ direct marketing for the SPOC program. The objectives of our presentation are to share the methods and design of our model of sepsis care that involves a remote monitoring team utilizing standard work for communication and intervention and providing real-time decision support to our bedside team. After this session, you should understand how to utilize the components of the care model to support early sepsis recognition and treatment, as well as anticipate barriers and challenges to implementation. A little bit about Wellspan Health. We are a not-for-profit integrated health system made up of six acute care, six acute care hospitals in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, those hospitals range in size from 50 to over 600 beds. We also have a behavioral health hospital and associated network of care settings, as well as a surgery and rehab hospital. Wellspan has over 220 ambulatory patient care locations including over 1,700 primary care and specialty care physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. Like many other healthcare systems, sepsis care has been a work in progress at Wellspan. And in 2017, we took an in-depth look into the sepsis care we were providing to our patients. So our average response times to sepsis alerts were steadily worsening. Our bundle compliance was a meager 34%, and our sepsis mortality was higher than expected. Data and reports sharing these opportunities with our clinical teams were on a three-month delay, which made performance improvement efforts extremely challenging. Additionally, our four acute care hospitals at the time were actually functioning on three different electronic health record platforms, which made implementation of standard work to reduce care variation a significant challenge. Our performance with sepsis care hasn't or hadn't always looked this way. So Wellspan York Hospital, which is our largest tertiary care center, had implemented a boots on the ground rapid response team to receive and respond to electronic sepsis alerts several years prior. This intervention generated significant improvements in bundle compliance and outcomes, and the team was extremely well received by care teams and leadership. 
On the graph on this slide, you can see that we started 2015 with over 70% sepsis bundle compliance, which is represented by the blue line, and our observed mortality was generally less than expected, shown by the observed to expected mortality ratio represented by the yellow line. So what happened over the course of that year? As it turns out, our sepsis response team was almost too successful and their list of responsibilities and demands grew. They were being asked to respond to more and more acute events that may or may not have been sepsis related. As a result, sepsis alert response time steadily declined. And as you can see, the departing bundle compliance and mortality lines clearly illustrating a deterioration in bundle compliance as our ability to respond to sepsis alerts in a timely manner worsened. Unfortunately, higher than expected sepsis mortality outcomes followed. We conducted an A3 project on this problem and that showed us that the sepsis response team was available to respond to alerts only 55% of the time. So it was clear that to be able to provide a timely response for all demands, additional RN resources would be required. Our data analyses really brought to light some opportunities for improvement, and we use this as a call to action. So in 2018, Wellsman embarked on a sepsis quality initiative with the ambitious goal of achieving national top performer status in sepsis care over the next three years. At the outset, we examined our prior improvement efforts and asked ourselves what worked, what didn't work, and what had worked initially but lacked sustainability. In addition to the boots on the ground sepsis response team just described, we also learned from a 2014 initiative to reduce overall sepsis mortality. Our interventions at that time did achieve significant improvements, but we had relied on engaging and training specific clinicians and team members. As we all know, priorities and people change over time. So this turned out to not be a very sustainable approach to ensure reliable care delivery. Based on these experiences and the need to scale solutions across the entire health system, it was clear that trying to utilize and improve upon existing processes would not allow us to reach our top performer goal. Our sepsis quality initiative incorporated three key concepts. Our clinical effectiveness team, is a system-wide multidisciplinary group that establishes best practice protocols. Decisions are based primarily on surviving sepsis campaign guidance combined with clinical experience and stakeholder input. This team is responsible for developing and endorsing any standardized tools such as the sepsis alert logic we use, order sets, and educational materials. Second, when designing electronic health record-based interventions, we made sure that the clinical teams were guiding technology instead of already established technology defining our processes and workflows. Our clinical team worked in collaboration with the informatics team to develop and embed evidence-based protocols and order sets into the electronic health record for spread across the system. And lastly, our experience with the bedside sepsis response team and unsustained mortality improvements were combined with air traffic controller and Google Glass concepts to create a novel central alert team model of care. In this model, automated EHR sepsis alerts are coupled with the expertise of a dedicated central clinical monitoring team, the CAT, who receive sepsis alerts, monitor patients, and provide real-time clinical decision support. Our sepsis quality initiative incorporated four key components. So coding and documentation, proactive care management, post-discharge medical management, and early recognition, appropriate stratification, and bundle adoption. We'll be going into more detail with each of these over the next few slides. The observed to expected sepsis mortality ratio was chosen as our key measure of success. So because of this, we not only wanted to target interventions that would influence the observed rate of sepsis in our communities, but we also wanted to understand what factors impacted expected mortality so that they could also be addressed. 
A review of sepsis cases was conducted by our quality coding and clinical documentation improvement teams, which brought to light opportunities in sepsis severity stratification and accurate capture of administrative designations. This was causing our expected mortality rates to be falsely low, and we addressed this issue from a couple of different angles. Our clinical efforts to improve early recognition and appropriate stratification for treatment purposes strengthen documentation and the resultant coding as sepsis, severe sepsis, or septic shock. We collaborated with our clinical documentation improvement team to improve the capture of organ failure criteria and assure the appropriate level of sepsis severity was documented. Additionally, the administrative designations of point of origin, admission type, and discharge destination were documented by registration and case management. These teams didn't realize the implications of inaccurate documentation, and they were most concerned with just making sure the fields were filled out in the EHR. So education and the establishment of standard processes to accurately and reliably capture administrative designations, as well as ongoing auditing, yielded significant improvements in our accuracy. Combined, these efforts in our documentation processes ensured that our expected sepsis mortality accurately reflected the true acuity and risk of our patients. Proactive care management was another key component to ensure that we were optimally managing patients across the care continuum. Focused effort was placed on establishing goals of care as early as possible and engaging palliative care and hospice when indicated. Sepsis, especially in older patients, is often a manifestation of chronic disease states and a marker of physiologic frailty rather than an acute isolated event. Timely hospice engagement provides both the appropriate level of care and resources for the patient and family while also improving mortality outcomes. Our largest hospital implemented an inpatient hospice service that rapidly engaged with the patient and family when consulted, and if eligible, enrolled them into hospice status while inpatient. Although this service was available for patients with any diagnosis, a significant number of participants had a sepsis diagnosis. We also partnered with skilled nursing facilities, home health, and EMS on early identification of sepsis in the community. Sepsis recognition and treatment education modules tailored to the staff and resources of skilled nursing facilities were provided using a train the trainer approach with our preferred provider facilities. Wellspan's Visiting Nurse Association implemented a simple sepsis screening tool that any clinician, nurse, or therapist completes at each visit. This tool has allowed for early identification and intervention on vital signs and functional abnormalities that may herald infection and sepsis at, in this at-risk population. And last, one of our acute care facilities, Good Samaritan Hospital, partnered with their primary emergency medical services provider to create a code sepsis. If patients meet certain vital sign and assessment criteria suspicious for sepsis, the medic notifies the hospital of the working diagnosis, administers fluid per EMS protocol, and collects blood specimens so they can be processed as soon as the patient hits the door. This partnership allows for the earliest possible recognition of sepsis and initiation of treatment as soon as the patient arrives at the hospital. Post-discharge medical management to prevent recurrence of sepsis and other complications was also critical to promoting positive outcomes. Patients were scheduled to see their primary care provider within seven days of discharge for assessment and medication review and adjustment. Health coaches associated with primary care practices also assess each patient for warning signs of possible sepsis recurrence as part of their regular outreaches and escalated patients who had significant symptoms. All sepsis patients being discharged to home were considered for referral to home health to ensure the key components of sepsis recovery were occurring. In addition to having a nurse make a clinical assessment, they were also able to ensure that the patient had adequate nutrition, hydration, mobilization, and were taking their medications. Some regions were also able to deploy community paramedics to check in on patients who didn't qualify or refused other services, 
taking vitals and making sure they were taking their antibiotics. The last component, early recognition, appropriate stratification, and bundle adoption was foundational to our improvement efforts, and our central alert team model of care was a significant driver of our success with these components. In the next section, we will go over how transparent and timely reporting of bundle performance, customized sepsis alerts, standardized order sets, and clinical decision support from the central alert team work together to drive clinical reliability. Okay, the graphic on this slide depicts our central alert team model in its entirety, so you can star this slide in your notes. On the top left of this figure, BHR data, in our case from EPIC, is run through the filter of sepsis alert logic. If criteria are met, a notification in the form of a sepsis alert fires from the electronic health record. The remote centralized monitoring team receives these alerts in real time, reviews the charts for gaps in care, and reaches out to the local team. This presents clinicians with a refined and actionable opportunity. Care provided by the local team is supported by standardized tools that offer a clear path to deliver the right care at the right time. EHR data comes into play again as process and outcome measures are reported to identify opportunities to optimize and refine processes. As this model is applied to many patients, the impact is amplified to the outcomes of the overall population, in this case, sepsis mortality. As I mentioned on the previous slide, a critical part of our success was the ability to provide our care teams with real-time data on performance. So we decided to move reporting of sepsis bundle compliance to concurrent review. Instead of reporting data that was two to three months old, we started reporting data that was only a week behind. Every Monday, our quality abstracting team receives a patient list for those people who were discharged with a primary diagnosis of sepsis during the prior week. Using this process, we identify and review all mortalities the abstractors work these cases throughout the week with a completion deadline of Friday. Data analysts collate and summarize the results for each hospital entity and distribute the reports by the end of the day on Friday. Outliers or cases where we failed to meet the bundle requirements are reviewed for clinical care variants or other opportunities for improvement. The cycle of continuous improvement has allowed us to make rapid cycle improvements to provide the best and most appropriate, as well as timely care for our patients. In the beginning, since the central alert team was a completely novel model of care, changes were made almost daily based on PDSA process. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Angie Mays to discuss the central alert team and EHR notifications we utilize to ensure early recognition and appropriate treatment of sepsis patients. Thank you, Brenna. In this section, I will be discussing our alert logic and the best practice alerts or BPAs that are sent to our local bedside teams, as well as the central alert team or CAT as we like to call ourselves. Before we could develop the best practice alert, we needed to determine the logic. Our sepsis alerts are based on a suite of algorithms that, are, that have age and population specific considerations. It is important to note that the electronic sepsis algorithms that we utilize are not the out of the box EPIC sepsis alert or the predictive model scores. They were developed internally based on the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines and our experience with the St. John sepsis identification algorithm. Over time, customizations were needed to improve the performance. These included exclusion criteria for specific events and populations, as well as tweaks to the criteria threshold. All the customizations were based on our own user experiences and patient populations. At the top of this schematic, you will see the data points considered by the algorithms embedded in the EPIC clinical decision support. Adult SERS alerts may fire for adults in the ED or our inpatient med surge unit. If certain systemic inflammatory markers are met, if 
If an indicator of organ failure is also present, an adult sepsis alert will be triggered, indicating a potential for higher severity of illness. Pediatric sepsis alerts leverage age-specific SIRS and organ failure criteria to identify sepsis in our younger population. Alerts are silenced for patient populations we found to have a high risk for triggering false alarms, including immediately post-op, fresh trauma, and ICU patients. Pediatric SIRS alerts, although initially used, were discontinued after our experience demonstrated an unacceptably high false positive rate. Obstetric patients are monitored using a published tool, the sepsis and obstetrics score. And lastly, our ED triage alert is our most sensitive alert, casting a broad net to identify potentially septic patients as they arrive to our facilities. When the alert performance was evaluated in our adult population, our algorithms were shown to have a sensitivity of 82%, a specificity of 94%, false negative rate of 18%, and a false positive rate of only 6%. Clinicians who open the chart of a patient who has triggered a sepsis alert will see a best practice advisory or BPA that indicates includes instructions on next steps specific to their discipline. In the next slides, I'll show you a couple of examples of this. It is important to note that for all BPAs, in addition to offering one-click initiation of standardized evidence-based sepsis treatment protocols, there are also options for clinicians to temporarily silence the alert if indicated. In this BPA, that, dis that displays to providers for patients meeting SIRS or sepsis algorithm criteria, the first option is to open the sepsis order set. Initially, we had the choice for the provider to order a stat lactic acid as well as the single choice of not sepsis or SIRS or in the same option that the patient was undergoing sepsis treatment. This was what the providers initially wanted the options to be in the beginning. However, after, as the process evolved, we realized that we were missing other components of the sepsis bundle when only a stat lactic acid was ordered. And there was confusion with the two options of not sepsis and SIRS and or going, undergoing treatment were part of the same choice. With input from our sepsis CET and data collected to support the decision, we eliminated the stat lactic acid and separated out the two decision points. Now the provider can open up the BPA and order from the sepsis order set or choose not related to infection or sepsis. And, the, and a third choice being um, that they are evaluating the patient for sepsis. Uh, they are not 100% convinced it's sepsis. The last option lets the central alert team know that they have not ruled out sepsis, but are waiting for further evaluation before initiating antibiotics. In most cases, when this option is chosen, labs, diagnostic, lactic acid, and blood cultures have been ordered. The advisory will be silenced for a period of one to 24 hours, depending on the scenario. However, just because a BPA has been silenced does not mean that the central alert team is not carefully watching still. Patients who have a positive, in, a positive screen, a sepsis screen at ED triage will fire the BPA on the right-hand side of this slide. This BPA is initially displayed to the RN who is presented with the, the easy button, so to speak, allowing them to initiate evidence-based protocol that starts the sepsis workup. You can see the orders on the left. This is important because the clock starts when the patient alerts, but we all know that during busy times, we may need patients to stay in the waiting room. We do not want to delay care, so giving this option encourages triage nurses to initiate diagnostic orders, which leads to quicker decisions regarding further sepsis treatment when the patient gets to the room. Providers may also be presented with this alert and option to initiate the workup if for whatever reason the nurse had not initiated the protocol orders before he or she saw the patient. No matter who orders the ED sepsis protocol, 
these orders mesh with the full sepsis order set that includes the guideline compliant antibiotic and fluid selection to prevent duplicative orders. It is also important to note that the central alert team is also watching patients who alert, even if they are in the waiting room. So now that I've told you a little bit about our algorithm and best practice alert, I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining what the central alert team or CAT is. This is my favorite topic, not just because I am a CAT nurse, but also because I feel that our work has facilitated impressive advancements in our sepsis care process. We set out to develop and implement a new care model that would help us improve in a way that we had never seen before. As Brenna stated earlier, we were experiencing worsening response times, decreasing bundle compliance, and increasing mortality rate. We know that early identification of sepsis is critically important. The literature tells us when we have early identification and appropriate treatment interventions, lives are saved and the devastating physical and cognitive effects of sepsis are decreased. We also know that, when we that we had to le leverage the power of the EHR, but it had to be done in a way that would avoid clinician alert fatigue. We knew that the boots on the ground approach was better, but still not effective as we wanted, as effective as we wanted, and certainly not practical for a now eight hospital system. As we shifted from our traditional care model to our new model, not only did we create a process that provided a safety net for our patients, but we also, but it was also much more efficient. In our initial go live, we were able to provide support for to four acute hospitals with only five FTE, much less than we needed for the traditional boots on the ground sepsis response. The central alert team nurses quickly became experts in alert logic, and as part of the rapid cycle improvement efforts, we were able to provide fast feedback to our IT partners, who refined and tweaked our internal alert algorithm to a level of precision not previously experienced. Epic alerts combined with the central alert team augment the care team's ability to provide compassionate and reliable, consistent with a reliable care consistent with best practice. So what exactly is the central alert team? We are a team of experienced RNs with critical and or emergency backgrounds who have uh, specialty training in sepsis. We provide monitoring of sepsis alerts from the central bunker 24 seven for eight hospitals. Initially, we worked from two locations but as the work evolved, we were able to transition to working from home. The central alert team was completely remote before COVID forced many others to do the same. Working from home gives the CAT staffing flexibility that allows the team to stay lean. For instance, if a nurse is getting overwhelmed with alerts, they can send out a text message just saying SOS. And there has never been a time when another CAT nurse has not been able to hop on and help. The CAT nurses receive all the sepsis alerts. They review the patient chart, click to see if the bedside team has initiated care or not, and if they haven't, then we reach out and request action. Upon discussion with the nurse and or physician, if the patient does not have sepsis, a note is put in the chart and the alert is silent and the case is closed to CAT follow-up. However, if the patient is septic, the CAT nurse will continue to track the patient and make sure that the appropriate bundle metrics are met in a timely fashion. We watch the clock. As many of the bundle elements have a time requirement, we, would like, we like to refer to ourselves as motivational timekeepers. In the case of patient deterioration, the central alert team will call the rapid response team or help team um, if additional escalation and response to support the bedside team is needed. Although the alerts that are, although some alerts are not sepsis, in most cases, if the patient alerts and is not, and does not meet the sepsis criteria, there is usually something else bad going on. The cat does not have blinders on, and although we are laser focused on sepsis, we have to facilitate care for other critically ill patients who may have had a bad outcome unrelated to sepsis. 
If attention is needed, regardless of the sus suspected diagnosis, the CAT team will escalate very quickly. <laughs> Before I get into some of the specifics about the team and lessons learned, I want to talk about development. Once we had leadership approval to move forward, we had a fairly aggressive timeline to stand the team up since implementation was aligned with the go live of our new EHR. We had about six weeks to write job descriptions, post the jobs, conduct interviews, hire and train the team. We met with the leadership team of each hospital to define workflows. Who would, do, who would be the first point of contact? How do we escalate if needed? We then did extensive education that continued through the first six months of the program. We learned over time how to scale the program to bring in additional hospitals as we had, as we had few new sites to integrate into our health system. We have an algorithm that looks at the overall ED and hospital volumes, as well as historical sepsis volumes to predict how many additional FTEs will be needed for expansion. With the aggressive startup um, timeline, it was decided to recruit only experienced critical care nurses. This group of nurses had real life understanding of disease process that was augmented by concentrated specialty sepsis education. They had honed their critical thinking skills and were able to evaluate the patient's diagnostic and documented symptoms to quickly determine if more action was needed. The group had spent years developing that sixth sense that experienced nurses have. However, a lot of that was based on sensory input received from the patient. We were all a little bit worried that we would not be able to rely on that without hands-on patient contact. But I'm happy to report that we quickly developed a virtual gut feeling. Instead of sensory input, we used digital input to form a picture of our patient. And we still get that bad feeling that causes us to follow a patient more closely. As experienced patient advocates, we were able to foster a culture change and gently push the new standardized sepsis care. Our experience with crucial conversations allowed us to convey our expertise while remaining unruffled, allowing us to build the needed relationships with the bedside teams. It is important that it was important that we gained their trust. Our years of bedside experience allowed us to convey professionalism and knowledge, as well as empathy. We listened to our bedside partners and changed our practice to best augment the care that they were, that they were giving. Lessons learned, <laughs> there were many. Um, in the beginning, everything was happening, happening so quickly. We relied on each hospital to inform their staff about the central alert team. However, quickly learned that there was some misinformation and in a lot of cases in the blur of going live with a new EHR, many of the bedside team do not, did not know who we were or what our role was. We knew in order to get buy-in, we needed to do on-site education. As part of our educational efforts, we used what we refer to as the cat cart which was a cart decorated with a poster, streamers, it had a sign that said cat cart and was loaded with goodies, like candy, fruit, snacks. It also had educational materials that included information on sepsis, the bundle and treatment algorithm, as well as a pamphlet that explained what the cat was and what we do. We visited the ED and all the nursing units with the cat cart on both day and night shift to meet as many of our bedside partners as possible and to do some relationship building while answering questions about the program. We learned that communication was critical to our success, and so, develop, so we developed the CAT CART program to go into facilities prior to go live to develop relationships ahead of time, as it also gave us the opportunity to answer questions and demonstrate the benefits of the new EHR prior to its use. We also learned to listen to our bedside team. Initially, we were calling the nurses in the ED for, for the alerts that required further action. This put them in a position of being the middleman because they would need to stop what they were doing and go ask the provider to considering order bundle, sepsis bundle components. It was suggested that we contact the provider directly. 
this was vetted through the CET and proved to be a staff satisfier. Well, to some degree. The nurses were happier because they were no longer receiving so many calls, but the providers found the calls disruptive. Again, we were able to leverage technology and started using secure, the secure chat function, which sends a text type message to both the nurse and the provider. Now when we call, they know it's very important. Um, being flexible and listening to our bedside partners allowed us to flourish and expand all well spent to all well spanned acute facilities. We were deliberate in our tiered approach. So when the central alert team first went live, we started with four acute care hospitals. Once our process was established, we brought on two additional sites, one of them being the biggest, which was York, the Wellspan Surgery and Rehab Hospital, and then Wellspan Field Haven, which is our behavioral health facility. Most recently this past fall, the CAT expanded operations again to bring in two new hospitals, which are Chambersburg and Waynesboro. These two facilities recently integrated into our health system and went live with Epic, which facilitated the CAT being able to monitor, their pa monitor the patients there as well. This efficient, innovative model allows us to monitor the sepsis best practice advisories and provide clinical decision support to our bedside team at all eight WellSpan acute care hospitals and customized workflows were developed with each facility to meet their specific needs. So using EPIC, we are able to pull robust data that allows us to monitor um, team activity and the number of patients impacted. This graph on the left shows the number of alerts filtered by type of alert, which are ED triage, SERS sepsis, pediatric sepsis, and OB sepsis. The graph on the right shows the magnitude of how far reaching this team is. From September 2017 through July 20, 2021, the Central Alert Team acted on just shy of 190,000 alerts. Those alerts accounted for a total of almost 72,000 patients. Patients can potentially alert multiple times, so that's why we track both the number of alerts as well as the number of patient encounters. During the review of alerts, the central alert team nurses document directly into EPIC by entering a flow sheet documentation as well as notes. That documentation allows us to keep track of how they're doing with timeliness of response, what type of alert they're taking, and really gives us valuable information about what's happening with the, with the care of these patients. Now I'm going to pass this on to Brenna, and she can tell you more about our, our incredible results. Thanks, Angie. Like Angie said, I'm going to review some of our additional results. The graph on this slide shows visually that the implementation and evolution of the central alert team model resulted in improved bundle compliance that was sustained over time. The bundle compliance rate is plotted on the x-axis from our manually abstracted data. The mortality rate on the y-axis comes from Premier, which is our data analytics tool. The graph demonstrates the correlation between improved bundle compliance and lower sepsis mortality. These improvements are statistically significant. An additional analysis was conducted to evaluate if there were any disparities in sepsis outcomes based on race and ethnicity, and no disparities were identified in that analysis. A few additional points. Early in our work, we selected a goal of 74% bundle compliance due to it being an inflection point associated with reduced mortality at our early high performer hospital, Gettysburg Hospital. Also, our abstraction of bundle compliance is not step one, but rather a modified bundle rooted in surviving sepsis campaign guidance. This allows us to focus on outliers of clinical significance rather than definitional dis disagreements. All bundle measures are abstracted for each patient to capture all opportunities for improvement, rather than stopping abstraction when a measure is missed, as is the case with step one. 
The population abstracted also includes simple sepsis in addition to traditional severe sepsis and septic shock of step one. Again, this offers a broader scope of performance. We, of course, do measure step one bundle compliance separately for public reporting purposes. Statistical analysis of this data has demonstrated that compliance with the sepsis bundle directly accounts for 64% of the decrease in sepsis mortality observed. This was an important finding because our improvement efforts involved several tactics as we talked about earlier. Our average time to screen a sepsis alert is consistently under 10 minutes, and we've seen significant and sustained improvements in, sy in system bundle compliance rates. In addition to these process outcomes, we've, we've seen substantial improvements in our sepsis mortality rates and observed to expected mortality rate, achieving national top decile performance compared to like hospitals, with York Hospital falling in the top 1%. This cascaded to improvements in total hospital mortality. Additionally, we saw a decrease in observed to expected length of stay and an increase in number of people identified, coded, and documented as sepsis and severe sepsis. We saw cost avoidance with improved clinical care and improved quality incentive earnings. Engaging leadership to buy into this model requires a leap of faith in value-based care, which is centered on the following principles. Clinical reliability will improve quality and reduce the cost of care. Improved documentation and coding will enhance DRG payment. Improved clinical outcomes can yield incentive earnings, and this model of care will save lives. Our senior leadership supported the investment into this model of care, and the lives saved and financial returns realized rewarded their faith and has established a platform which allows us to spread our model of care to other areas. Most of our currently published and reported outcomes take into account our data through the end of 2019. So you may be wondering how the Central Alert Team fared in 2020, which was a year like no other for all of us. Wellspan experienced the majority of our COVID-19 admissions during the fall of 2020 and winter of 2021. This slide illustrates the volume of our sepsis alerts during fiscal year 2021 with our major COVID-19 surge period falling in the middle of this graph, and that's circled in red. During this time, the cat really became the eyes in the sky. Monitoring patients while bedside teams were challenged with managing the influx of patients, dealing with daily changes in staff and workflows, and maintaining strict infection control precautions. Our average alerts per day are approximately 90 to 100, but that swelled to about 135 alerts per day during our busiest month last year in December of 2020, when the CAT responded to over 4,000 sepsis alerts in one month alone. Despite the in increase in patients and alerts, our, kit, our CAT was able to rapidly scale up to meet the demand, and we maintained an average alert response time of about six to seven minutes throughout this time period. As Angie also mentioned, the CAT care model went live with two of our additional acute care hospitals in mid-November of 2020, so that added some challenges as we were um, significantly scaling up to meet all of these needs. And how about our sepsis bundle compliance? So all of this is happening. As you can see on this graph, we maintained excellent bundle compliance through fiscal year 2021 and achieved 100% bundle compliance during our busiest sepsis alert months of November and December 2020. Last, you're probably wondering what happened to our sepsis mortality outcomes over the past year. First, let me orient you to this graph. The red dotted line at the top represents an observed to expected mortality ratio of one. Values above this line indicate that the observed mortality rate is above the expected mortality rate, while values below the line indicate that the observed mortality rate 
is below the expected mortality rate. So you always want to stay below that red dotted line. The green line on this graph represents our observed to expected mortality in fiscal year 2020, while the yellow line represents our observed to expected mortality during fiscal year 2021. Using a standard peer comparison from Premier, our quality benchmarking tool. As you can see, our observed to expected mortality was similar during a year to year comparison with our observed mortality consistently maintained well below expected. Additionally, WealthSpan maintained national top death file performance status when compared to like peers over the past year. So despite erratic increases in patient volume and acuity and challenges experienced by clinical staff as a result of COVID-19, our mortality outcomes with sepsis remained rock solid. These results are a true testament to the success of this program, which ensures clinical reliability and reduced care variation despite the unpredictability of what may be happening at the bedside. In summary, the Central Alert Team Platform of Care is a digital tool designed to leverage humanity to put the focus back on the people providing care. Incorporating a disruptive technology like the electronic health record and our legacy approaches has caused us to fail to realize its full potential and in many cases created systems and workflows that clinicians despise. So by sorting through complex EHR data and offering actionable opportunities, the central alert team model of care redesign offers enhanced clinical judgment and increased ability for clinicians to be able to focus on the human elements of care. Algorithms and tools guide clinicians to make evidence-based decisions rather than relying on individual provider knowledge and skill. By cutting through some of the digital noise, there's improved opportunity for providers to connect with people and provide the human side of healthcare that can't be performed by technology. Communication is enhanced as the central team monitors a patient's course across the continuum of care. This model offers a roadmap for care redesign and sepsis, but it also has applications in many other disease states, and we're currently working on a similar model for early recognition and management of cardiogenic shock. If you want to learn more, the links to the articles on this slide will provide additional workflow details and data. And at this time, we'd like to thank you all for your time and attention, and I will turn the presentation back over to Christine. Thank you, Angie and Brenna. This concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Please click on the three dots, then click Q&A to open the Q&A panel and direct your questions to all panelists, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. So, Brenna and Angie, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is related to um, the notification once you receive an alert. What is the time of notification from the remote to notification? We receive the notifications almost real time as soon as the alert fires. Um, our response times are around seven minutes to we get to the alert and start reviewing it. Okay, thank you. Another question, um, did you define the maximum number of patients each nurse would monitor at any given time? We have not defined a specific number. Um, we have increased staffing. We know when the majority of our alerts come in from the ED. And so whenever the ED is busy, then we are busy. And so that's usually second shift. So we do during those busy times, and we, we base that on data collection, have two cat nurses on working together and then any other time, if a cat nurse is overwhelmed, they can, you know, just text and um, text SOS to the team. And like I said, somebody, we haven't had a, we haven't had a, 
any time yet where somebody hasn't gone on to help um, just to cover that higher volume time or allow that nurse to get caught up. Because sometimes we are spending a lot of time on just one alert. And um, so that might be a, that might be the reason that we fell behind, but we're there for each other and we, we do hop on and help. Thank you so much, Angie. Do you use the EPIC sepsis model? We do not use the EPIC predictive sepsis model for our alerts. So these were um, alerts that we created from scratch and have modified over time to um, improve accuracy and precision and also, you know, improve um, the basically the interaction of our alerts with our central alert team and our bedside team. Um, and it was, we originally had created a sepsis alert tool using the um, St. John sepsis um, program with Cerner. And then when we transitioned to Epic, um, we felt that um, we um, could create something novel that would actually um, work even better than, than Epic's out of the box. Um, sepsis tool and what we found in, in comparing them directly is that our um, alerts are um, certainly um, more accurate and, and precise than the EPIC um, sepsis tool that's available. I don't know if you had anything to add, Angie. No, I, I agree. I think um, just based on our specificity and inclusion, we are doing better than the EPIC tool currently. Very good, thank you. Another question, how did you address alert fatigue? Um, so with the, our concern was with the bedside alert fatigue. So they are receiving a variety of different alerts. The CAT team only receives the sepsis alert. And we, that those are the only alert because those are the only alerts that we're receiving. There's not there's no fatigue on our point on, on our side, but the bedside team who has um, competing priorities. Sometimes these alerts can be lost. And so we are reviewing every single sepsis alert. Some of them don't need to be escalated to the bedside team and we can just sign those patients off. And others that do need escalated to the bedside team, we're very in, intentional on what we're, what we're communicating to them and when, so that they're not getting overwhelmed, but the patients are still receiving the timely bundle components that they need to get the evidence-based best practice care for sepsis. Thank you. How were you able to convince leadership to agree to allow the team to work from home? Brenda, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? <laughs> I, I actually wasn't involved in that um, decision and pro process. So if you want to answer it, Angie, that would be great. I mean, like Brenda said in the presentation, it really was a leap of faith. Um, nothing that we were doing was um, working the way, the way we wanted it to work 100% of the time. And we had this model and, you know, it was like, let's just try it out. And, you know, it's not, it's not easy to get anybody to commit to, <laughs> to five FTEs, but um, they took that leap of, leap of faith and I'm certainly glad that they did. And in the long run, it has actually um, saved money and saved lives. And, and Angie, I think, I think maybe the question was surrounding um, the ability for the, the cat to work from home. So uh, I guess um, the decision of- Oh, of oh I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, no, it's okay. Um. I just wanted to that. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Brenna, for Thanks. keeping me on track. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so working from home, that was a combination of the team wanting to work from home and 
since we didn't have any patient contact, it almost made sense. We did have um, a protocol in place. So if there was bad weather, we could work from home, but we were sharing a laptop. So it didn't, it, we would still have to try and get that laptop to whoever was working. And, you know, office space is not easy to, to come by and we were taking up office space and it, staffing wasn't as flexible. Certainly if you have people that need to come into a facility to do their job, they're less likely to be able to come in and help just for a couple hours or even to cover an ill call. But if you're allowing them to work from home, then you, you don't, you can work with a smaller team and have all of that covered. So that was really our rationale for that. So the webinar will soon be ending, but we have time for a few more questions before we end the program. Uh, we have a question. Uh, we use EPIC and the sepsis screening is not in our mini triage. How did you get past this and get staff to use the screen? Well, ours is, is um, a homegrown sepsis alerting system. So it's all been customized for us. And the ED, the ED alerts and the ED screening was all part of the customized build that our, our IT department and our project one department, our EPIC um, implementation um, team did for us. So it's pretty specific to us <laughs> is, all, is all I can say. So I don't know how you would get that turned on at your facility without, you know, that that's something that, that we're looking at marketing, but I don't want to talk about that. So. Thank you so much, Angie. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Special thanks to Brenna and Angie for a great presentation. If you have experienced any issues accessing the evaluation or certificate of continuing education, please feel free to direct any questions to Shelly Mixell at shmixell -E at pa.gov. This concludes our webinar.